Wheeling, West Virginia has a very colorful history. I recently visited Wheeling area historian and author George T. Sideropoulos. George was kind enough to invite me into his home to discuss his memories, experiences, and research into the crime history of Wheeling. Well, hello and uh, welcome. I'm here with George Sideropoulos. We're going to discuss his book, Murder Never Dies, about some of the interesting stories of Wheeling's uh, nefarious past. How are you doing tonight, George? I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah, it's good to be seen, isn't it? It is, and thank you for coming. Yeah, you're looking particularly dapper. I really like your hat. Well, it's, uh, no, it, it serves its purpose. That's right. <laughs> Keeps your head warm. It does. Keeps you looking good. Even inside, yes. Yes, sir. So how did you decide to write your book? What, what, what inspired you to write it? Well, there has been a lot written about uh, crime in Wheeling during that period from 1930 to, to uh, the 70s. And, uh, but much of it uh, has been uh, false narrative, non-factual, uh, street talk, anecdotal. And I just thought that history deserved a uh, book based on facts. And uh, fortunately, I was able to uh, to be uh, close to some of the associates and uh, some of the uh, operators involved and shared a great many stories and details. And I kept copious notes and contemporaneous notes and uh, never believing that one day I'd write a book, but uh, just for conversation. Nice. So you're very uh, professional in your career, and you did that as well in your collection of um, history and stories then, huh? That's correct. That's correct. Now, now what's your earliest uh, memory of uh, crime and wheeling, or when did you first become aware of it? Well, <clears throat> when I was a young man, uh, 17 or 18, of course, there were not... Uh, there were not uh, enforced restrictions like there are today, but I did a lot of cabaret. I went to uh, a little bit of a gambler, went to a lot of the nightclubs, and Wheeling uh, in the 50s, in the late in the early 60s, was a cross between uh, Bourbon Street and the old Strip District in Vegas. I mean, there was all the gambling you wanted and uh, every form of gambling that existed, bars, restaurants, open all night. And um, ironically, it was a safe city. He, I mean, you could walk down the street at 2.30 in the morning with your pants down, no one would bother you. Because at the time, Lias was in charge. He didn't want any heat on his operations. He kept the churches happy. He kept the uh, politicians and the business people happy. So uh, he, uh, he curtailed, with strict enforcement, any uh, robberies or uh, looting or assaults. I mean, I've, I've always <clears throat> had a respect for the uh, operation that he maintained. Because I look at major cities and even Wheeling today, where the uh, prevalence of drugs is just uh, horrible, uh, killing, killing our kids. If a Colombian cartel located at 12th and Market Street in Wheeling, when Elias ruled the city, there'd be more dead bodies in the river than there are fish. Oh, I believe it. Okay. Now, those of us who don't know who built Bill Lias is. Tell us who Bill Lias is. Well, he immigrated. <clears throat> uh, well, there's some controversy there. First, they tried to deport him because he was an illegal alien. But in fact, uh, he uh, demonstrated that he was born in Wheeling in uh, 1909, I believe. Or no, 1900. 1900. And um, his... Uh, his uncle had a bakery in the uh, market house. And Bill, uh, when he was a young man, uh, ran, uh, had a small bootlegging operation and uh, had uh, 
whiskey and wine in the back of the bread wagon and started then. Now, was that during Prohibition or what was the it time was. period? Prohibition began uh, <clears throat> earlier in West Virginia. The um, Prohibition was, uh, was uh, passed in, Pro in West Virginia in 1914 and uh, not until 1919 was the Volstead Act uh, nationally. So Bill got a head start on Prohibition. And he went from uh, driving his uh, grandfather's bread truck <clears throat> until uh, uh, with a major operation, major bootlegging operation. He and uh, the uh, capo from the Cleveland outfit, Blackie Lecavoli, became friends. They used to uh, transport whiskey across the um, across the river from Canada into Michigan, and then Blackie took his to Cleveland, Bill brought his to Wheeling, and uh, culminated in enormous wealth just from his bootleg bootlegging traffic. He, he operated in three states, West Virginia, PA, Western PA, and Ohio. And uh, in fact, he had, uh, his headquarters was located well, I think it was the 21st in Main Street. It was the size of a gymnasium when it pulled a number. And of course, back then you could bet 10 cents or a dollar and it paid 600 to one. And uh, it's alleged, and I tend to believe it, that the roll <laughs> of the dice was, uh, was fixed. Sure. And Bill would, uh, once the vendors turned in all their numbers and all their bets, Bill would review them and uh, make certain that the uh, majority of, uh, if there was a majority of ones or twos, he put the loaded dice in and make sure one or two didn't show up. So he paid off, but he didn't pay off the big ones. Yeah, so he kind of bit into it a little bit, but not all the way, yeah. Right. He, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, he's a businessman after all, right? Oh, indeed he was. He was, he was brilliant. He had, had a sixth grade education, Still, to, 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 he died in 1970, and the day of his demise, he spoke broken English. Bill uh, had a peculiar uh, tone. He, uh, short sentence, and he barked. Now tell me about some of the other characters that were in the posse, some of the people that worked with them that, that maybe you met or have some stories yeah, about. Well, he had muscle, and I, I knew a couple of his, knew who they were, I didn't know them personally. I knew his, uh, I interviewed uh, a gentleman who worked for Bill Weiss and Paul Hankish, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, Jimmy, I said, uh, you work for Bill and you work for Paul, who'd you fear most? He said, well, Bill would kill you for an orange, but Paul would put poison in your kid's milk. Now, I don't think that's true, I think that's an exaggeration. Bill might kill you if you ate his orange, but not for anyone else's. Oh my gosh. And yeah, uh, yeah. I heard that uh, Hankish was quite vindictive, yes. He was. He was, Paul was nihilistic. Um, he uh, was embittered uh, from the bombing, knew who did it. And uh, if, he, if he liked you, you were okay. If he didn't, uh, you were on the outs and he'd do anything he could to, you know, not to put you in harm's way, he'd put you in harm's way. So those of you uh, joining us, um, Paul Hankish was a mob boss in Wheeling, kind of followed after Bill Elias. That's and right. um, I believe there was a little bit of um, some muscle there when he took it over, right? So how did that happen? How did it, how did it turn over from Bill Elias to Paul Hankish? Well, Bill, in 1952, the federal government seized all of Bill's tangible assets, racetrack, casino, slot machines, and uh, they didn't leave Bill with nothing, of course. He had money hidden, I'm sure. sure. And so he started in an old club that he owned, and he named it Billy's. He started a Greek dice game called Barboot. 
Marboot's a fascinating game. It still exists in uh, many parts of the country. It's uh, a set of dice. It's rolled. There's four winners and four losers. And what uh, happens is the, uh, guy, the guy that's holding the dice, he makes the bet. So let's say he bets $2,000. And there's five guys playing and they, they bet enough to cover his bet of 2000 Some will bet he wins, some will bet he loses. And Bill would take 2.5% cut. Well, that game would probably last, well, they ran it Friday and Saturday into Sunday morning, every week. That game would probably last about 10 hours. There's probably 300 rolls an hour. And, uh, the average bet was two thousand dollars. Two and a half percent is uh, two hundred fifty dollars. Three hundred rolls, seventy five hundred, and uh, and uh, by the time it was all over, Bill was grossing above fifty thousand dollars a week from that dice game. Well, Paul Hankish was just emerging into the gangster crowd. He decided to start a bar boot game. And it was at uh, the Oyster Bar on 16th Street. Well, Bill sent word that, uh, you know, shut it down. But uh, Bill, uh, Paul wouldn't listen. As a matter of fact, he, uh, he had a sketch drawn of Bill with the words underneath, Never trust a man whose ass is bigger than his shoulder, wider than his shoulders. That didn't help. No. So Bill had contacts in Cleveland, like I said, with Black Lacavoli. My understanding was that uh, they sent two guys to uh, to whack him out, and they didn't have C4 or any of those explosives back then. It was just dynamite. And Lord knows how many sticks of dynamite they poured out under his car. And Lord only knows how he survived. But he did survive. But he laid low. Bill continued the dice game. But he didn't have the juice that he once had with senators, with congressmen, with local politicians, with law enforcement. Because he was, he, was, he was ill quite a bit. So he sent his... Uh, son-in-law into operated lasted just a short period of time. So when Bill died in 1970, of course, Paul emerged, you know, just without any resistance. And he started, uh, he started really uh, in uh, hijacking and uh, uh, he had a, um, he had a booster a shoplifting outfit composed of uh, three to five people. <clears throat> and um, he would get tips from all over the country. Uh, Nord Nordstrom's, uh, upscale jewelry stores, what have you. It, most likely it was an addict that worked there that would tell him what they had, what was viable, the best time to come, where the cameras were, he'd send that crew down. Once one of the crew members told me that uh, he went to Neiman's, Neiman Marcus in Texas, I believe, because the Paul got to call that there was a vase or a vase, it's worth $35,000. So this, this shoplifting crew was professional. One of the men went down there with, with another lady she faked a pregnancy, was pushing a baby carriage. They went in, guy gave him the location, put the vase in the baby carriage, walked out. And they got 30 points uh, for what they get, get sold it to Paul. Sure. So they picked up uh, $9,000 for stealing the vase. And then Paul would, it was easier to donate an item of value than it was someone to take cash. So he used that a lot. Well, the other thing is <clears throat> the number of houses of ill repute mm -hmm. that were in Wheeling. 
32 once. Right? Okay. But Bill never had any direct interest in him. He won him with the ancillary business. I mean, the guys that went to the whorehouse, they generally came and ate steaks and, yeah. and gambled. Or right. they ate steaks and gambled, then went to the whorehouse. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I'm with George Sideropoulos. We're talking about his book, Murder Never Dies. Um, George, explain to us the context of your book, what it covers from front to back. Just a quick overview. Well, it covers... Uh, the beginning of the crime, one of the, the first crime lord, which was Bill Elias, and all the way through Paul Hankish, uh, who uh, who succeeded Elias as the uh, crime boss in the Wheeling. Now, of course, when I say, when I use the word Wheeling, their workstation was Wheeling, but much of their influence and much of their income was derived across the country. Uh, Hanky had connections from Wheeling to Lebanon, to South America, powerful. As a matter of fact, when I, the book was finally printed, uh, a U.S. attorney, assistant U.S. attorney, is my friend called me and he says, George, he said, I've got a fellow who's a, um, an investigator for the IRS and he's got a photograph of, uh, Nixon, uh, Hankish, and uh, another, dr another drug lord that was real close to Nixon. Uh, but I couldn't get it. I couldn't, well, there wasn't time enough. But Paul had tremendous influence. Um, he had a stealth operation. Uh, Bill was pretentious, wanted to be liked. Uh, sociable, somewhat charitable. But the dichotomy was he, he'd be in the front pew at church every Sunday just after he had someone murdered on a Saturday night. Elias, again, was nihilistic and embittered, but he was, in fact, the most powerful, non-Sicilian uh, associate of the Mafia. He was very close to the Gambino family and very close to, to, to New York crime family. It's powerful. Now tell me about the, the Wheeling area. You know, you can walk the streets of Wheeling where these crimes happened. Maybe walk us through some of the stories you've heard and some of the places that people could go to. I don't think they could really relive them, but you know, I think yeah. you could definitely lay eyes on where, yeah. where things happened. Well, most of them were demolished. The uh, the uh, Allen's Coffee Shop, of course, and um, and uh, Hankish's Hankish's restaurant, um, and of course uh, all the houses of ill repute that were between 21st and 23rd Street, uh, Billy's nightclub demolished, um, and a lot all the sports book locations are are gone. One that was uh, contiguous to Rogers Hotel, it still stands, but that was uh, Hankish's uh, primary uh, horse book and football booking operation right there. And um, of course the uh, <clears throat> the site where Hankish uh, is, uh, was bombed, as a matter of fact, when I had uh, I had a uh, book signing and an event at the public library, Ohio County Public Library. And it was the largest uh, turnout they had ever had. And in the crowd was a, a nurse who cared for Hankish when he was, after he got bombed, and a fireman who helped uh, extricate him from the uh, from the vehicle, and the nurse indicated that uh, that Hankish uh, was very, uh, very cordial, very kind, and uh, and didn't show any bitterness while she was treating him. And uh, the fireman indicated that they had 
piece of metal that went through Agish's leg that they couldn't remove. So they cut both ends off and left the remainder in. So uh, that was tremendous. But Hankish also had uh, a demonstration of his power with the mafia was that his daughter, his eldest child, Rosemary, her godfather was um, Joe Cavella, Joe Demas Cavella. He was the godson of uh, Sam the Plumber de Cavalcante, powerful individual. Chris, his godfather was uh, Gabriel Kelly Manorino, a major Gambino affiliate in Western Pennsylvania. And his youngest son, Peter, his godfather was uh, Joey Naples, the godfather of uh, Youngstown Mafia. So he, uh, he cemented his connections. Now, these guys got along with the um, government, with the police. They all seemed to work together. They were kind of in bed, weren't they, to a point? Well, Bill more, much, much, much more than, than Paul. Bill, he owned everybody from the traffic cop uh, to senators, congressmen, judges, prosecutors. He had probably had as many people on the payroll as wheeling steel. He, he was a master at bribery. He knew what to give and who to give it to. Um, as an example, he was on trial in Elkins on, on a federal charge. <clears throat> and uh, his attorney convinced him to plead guilty and that uh, was certain that the judge who he was very close with would give him probation. Bill pled guilty. The judge gave him three years. Bill went crazy. Back to the hotel on the horn. Next day, back in court. Repealed his, um, his plea of guilty. Judge agreed. Gave him probation. One day, three years, gone. Had a lot of influence. And <clears throat> during his deportation, deportation trial that lasted years. They claimed that Bill was born in Greece and be, as an illegal alien, he, um, he departed the United States into Canada without doing the proper transa transactional work and paperwork. So they claimed he was an illegal alien and tried to deport him. So, after about five years, an appeal, an appeal, an appeal, it's in the hands of a federal judge in D.C. There was a man named Zavatsky, reputable stockbroker in, in Wheeling. It was about in his late 70s, I went down to interview him. He and Bill were very good friends. Mr. Zavatsky was a stand-up, straight shooter. But they got along well. Savatsky had a uh, service station across from the cathedral, and uh, Bill's fleet of vehicles was, was serviced there. Bought his tires there, gas there, and so he and Zavatsky became close friends. So I went into Zavatsky's office, <clears throat> sat down, introduced myself, and um, I had a tape recorder about this size. And I said, uh, Mr. Zavatsky, I, I, I appreciate you seeing me. I want to talk to you a little bit about Bill Elias. And he said, uh, he motioned, put the tape recorder away. I did. <laughs> and he said, uh, among the things he told me was, Bill invited me to dinner at his house one evening. He said his attorney was going to be there. Wanted me to be privileged to the discussion. He said we had a nice Greek meal, grape leaves, rice, uh, lamb. <clears throat> and after dinner, Bill brought out the ouzo, had a little bit of ouzo. And at that time, Bill got up. It's the only way he could get his wallet out of his back pocket. Pulled his wallet out, took a note out, looked at his attorney. He said, Ike is, uh, plays poker on Sunday nights. He said, there's his private number. I want you to call him 
asking more my deportation trial is whether my appeal is going to be approved. Now, Zavatsky told me that the attorney just didn't know whether to believe him or not. And Bill said, go ahead. So the attorney picks up the phone, tells the operator the number. And as best as he can recall, he said, that the attorney said, Mr. President, I'm, uh, I'm legal counsel for Bill Elias, and I'm sorry to bother you, but he asked me to call you to see how his deportation appeal was, was moving. Okay, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hung up. I said, what did he say? He said, well, the judge and, and, and Eisenhower's term was about to end. And he said that the judge that's, that's handling the case will be here forever because he's got a lifetime appointment. So don't worry about it. But anyway, it's moving. He said the next month they upheld Bill's appeal. That's how powerful he was. Why? Huh? Powerful. Things were much different then. Well, thank you for sharing all this great information. Is there anything you want to leave us with? Any final um, remarks or? Uh... Yeah, I'll just tell you a funny story. Yeah, thank you. Um, Bill had nothing to do with the houses of ill repute. And the sheriff testified at one time there were 32 houses of ill repute in Wheeling. One of the fellows at the uh, busiest houses, uh, was a friend of mine. He was a muscle at the door, and he was also the um, security at the uh, door of the Hi-Fi nightclub in Wheeling, owned by Danny Phillips. So we went for coffee one morning, and he said, uh, Fritz, Fritz Falcone was his name, great guy. He said, Georgie said, uh, oh, and in the daytime, he was also a machinist at Block Brothers. He said, Georgie, I want to tell you a funny story. He said, you know, we leave Saturday mornings open to the some of the local professionals, businessmen, the mayor, councilman, cop. So, you know, they want to come and he said uh, they don't want to be seen by anybody else. So he said the law never comes on Saturdays because they know what we're doing. Plus, when they do come, it's on a weekday and generally, you know, that the girls get fined $105 and the madam usually pays for it and they're back out the next day. He says, well, one Saturday morning, I'm in there and there's a bang on the door. He said, and um, the madam goes to the door and I hear her saying, what are you doing here? He said, and I got a little closer and it was the cops. And uh, they said, I'm going to do some arresting. She said, it's Saturday. Open the door. So she turns to Fritz and she said, Fritz, get that goofy city manager down here because the city manager was upstairs. Yeah. And so Fritz said he went upstairs and the city manager's laying in bed naked. He said, hey, get dressed and get up. Jump out that window. It's only a 10 foot fall. Cops are downstairs or hide under the bed. So he said, Fritz went downstairs. There's about five cops in there. They're arresting the girls and they're arresting the, there was three guys in there, maybe uh, hanging around. And he said, uh, the city manager, all of a sudden the city manager walks downstairs, shoes untied. He said, he went up to the cops and said, where have you guys been? I've been waiting here for an hour for you. <laughs> it was. Oh my gosh. True story. Yeah, you know, you got to play it off, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, happy trails, and uh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're really welcome. enjoyed spending some time with you. Give me some love thank there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. So, uh, stay tuned. We'll have some uh, more stories coming soon.